two days uh, getting this all set up for our first uh, inaugural uh, dance here. Uh, it's uh, it's been a, it's been quite an amazing time for the last year, just going out to different other conferences, um, meeting with many different people. A lot of the Mach 37 graduates have uh, given us a lot of tips and pointers. A lot of the guys from a lot of the other B sides events. Um, forgotten, I know that you're one of the main guys who've uh, given us an earful of all the things to uh, avoid making mistakes. And, uh, we definitely appreciate everything along the way. Um, I'm not going to talk too long because I want to get to the keynote, but I just want to uh, maybe touch on a couple of small things, uh, maybe some questions that you guys have. Um, so we, we came up with this logo, and I just want to kind of touch on, on, on how we came up with it. Uh, it it's, uh, we're looking from right to left. It's from the uh, George uh, Washington Memorial in Alexandria. Um, following the line of the metro all the way up to the CIT building. Um, if you look at uh, the Northern Virginia Technology Council, they put out this uh, map uh, technopedia that they had a little while ago, and this was a pretty big inspiration for, for us and for the conference. Uh, all the purple uh, icons on there are for startup technology, and a lot of which are cyber companies in, in Virginia. And if you look at the kind of the, the heat map going from Alexandria following the metro line all the way up to the CIT building, it's a huge amount of cyber and, and technology companies in the area. And uh, so we thought about like, what do a lot of the other B-sides events do? Some of them focus on offense, some of them focus on defense. Uh, we, we thought that maybe we'd, we'd uh, just leave the papers open for the best paper to win for the general talks, but we had uh, a bunch of panels and uh, a happy hour that we kind of geared towards entrepreneurship and cyber. So we're going to feature a lot of uh, people who have been very successful starting their own companies here, give you guys a chance to kind of listen to some of their success and failures. Um, a lot of our keynotes we kind of picked because we saw how, how they uh, you know, were very successful starting off on their own. You know, some from the government sector that you'll hear from now. And, uh, and so that, that was kind of a, a lot of our inspiration. So uh, without further ado, give uh, Sophia yeah. a chance. So uh, thank you, Sophia, uh, here. Thank you all for coming today um, and showing up on a Saturday morning. Um, so I want to thank a few people. And uh, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors, um, especially the one that signed up with us early on, um, recorded here with Mac 37 who uh, didn't hesitate uh, to sign up with us. So thank you for that opportunity. This beautiful space. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, uh, Kathleen with um, uh, Clear Jobs, who's just been an amazing help and uh, resource and support, um, and all the others. I don't want to leave anybody out, so I'll just say all the others. Um, also, we want to bring awareness that we have a hiring out corner going on. Um, we have sections where you can have a one-on-one -on -one talk with some of the sponsors and recruiters uh, if you want to check out. Um, we also have a hiring list that you should definitely check out if you want to talk to them one-on-one -on -one about one of the job listings. And uh, finally, I'll wrap this up real quick. I wanted to thank all the volunteers that are here today that came here Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and volunteered their time to help the community. Um, the InfoSec has been amazing um, with all their help um, and even advices and um, things that they can bring to the con. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the day. And um, we'll introduce Rick Gordon now uh, with Mark 37. He, um, he started Mark 37. That's uh, an accelerator. If you don't know about Mark 37, you should definitely check out their suite. It's upstairs in the second floor. <laughs> thank you. So uh, before I get started, I just uh, thanks you guys for asking us uh, to participate in this. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Mach 37, and you'll understand why this uh, this makes uh, so much sense. But uh, for us to participate, but um, also uh, let me congratulate you. I know it's just the beginning of the day, but you've really done an incredible job. So uh, congratulations so far. Um, just a real quick, uh, you guys, about Mach 37, just so you understand what, what we are. We're, we're an accelerator. We uh, make in investments in cybersecurity uh, product companies. We were founded in 2013 really based on, I think, the recognition that uh, in the region between Howard County, Maryland, and Fairfax County, Virginia, there is more cybersecurity talent uh, than any place else on the planet. Uh, what we in the Commonwealth and at CIT uh, weren't seeing, though, was that uh, that advanced capability that was mostly being birthed out of uh, the um, the infrastructure supporting the national security and the intelligence community. Uh, uh, that those capabilities weren't being uh, migrated 
uh, into um, into products for our solutions that we're protecting the commercial sector. It was important to uh, the country for a lot of reasons, most of which is that critical infrastructure supported by the commercial sector as well as most of our uh, nation's intellectual property is owned by co the commercial sector. It was important to the Commonwealth uh, because we needed to, uh, to diversify our, our economic growth away from contracting uh, federal budgets. Um, so we built an accelerator. Uh, that we thought could, could effectively harness that intellectual capital base and, and start to drive uh, disruptive security product companies into the market. Uh, and so far, uh, I think we've been incredibly successful. We, we've launched 40 uh, disruptive cybersecurity product companies in, in the last three and a half years. Uh, we're getting ready to make uh, six more investments in the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, you'll get a chance uh, today to meet some of those founders uh, who will uh, share uh, some of their experience with you. If, if Mach 37 isn't, isn't anything, uh, what we are are advocates uh, for technical founders. Uh, you know, typically individuals that are, are engineers or analysts, uh, oftentimes working in a security operations center that are vexed by a particular problem, uh, and then invent something. Uh, they come up with an innovation that makes their job easier, uh, allows them to get home sooner, uh, and when we find them, uh, if there's an opportunity for them to commercialize it, uh, we advocate for them. That means we make an investment in them and we teach them how to build that idea into a thriving uh, commercial company. So uh, that's why uh, our advocacy for technical founders um, is important to us. Uh, that's why we have, uh, it, since we started, we've had a relationship with these sides uh, and we're thrilled uh, to participate in this one. Uh, so thank you guys for that. It also makes a ton of sense uh, that I get to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Um, I cannot think of um, uh, any any better rep, uh, representative of a successful technical founder uh, than than Ron Gula. So uh, I you know I, I will uh, read a little bit of his bio, uh, but I, I suspect most of you know it. Um, you know Ron started his career in security at the NSA as a pen tester. At BBN, he developed network honeypots uh, to lure hackers, um, and as he ran US Internet work, the U.S. Internet Working Team of Penetration Testers. Um, at Network Security Wizards, they developed Dragon, which was the first, the first uh, IPS, right? Naturally language. Naturally language speaking IPS. Um, thank you for that. And as, uh, as the CEO of Tenable, you can turn that down a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Ron led the company to incredible growth, um, and it's uh, it's one that we use as uh, you know perhaps um, a guide a guide for our technical founders and and how you could do this uh, and be successful. So hopefully, Ron, you'll talk a little bit about that uh, and uh, a little bit about the advocacy that uh, you're engaged in now uh, for technical founders doing innovative things in our space. Please, everybody, welcome Ron Kula. Thank you very much. And uh, you guys can't see it from here, but Patrick and Sophia, like, things have started. I, I actually asked this morning, oh, how many times have they done this? Because it's being run like you guys have been doing this for like four or five years. So congratulations. Um, very cool. So normally, I don't speak with, with slides, which I can react to things in the news like uh, Cloudbleed, you know, and comment on stuff like that. But I got some slides today. And we're going to talk about a couple, couple different things. No, no, we're not. All right, there we go. All right. Um, so very cool. So we're going to talk about a couple, a couple different things. Like, thanks for the introduction in the background. Um, happy to talk about any of these things. I'm going to try to leave some time for uh, for, for Q and A here a little bit. But we're going to talk about a couple different things. We're going to talk about the cyber market in general. I think everybody here, whether you're in the government, you're in commercial, you're starting a business, you're teaching about cybersecurity, you deal with solutions, whether it's a vendor commercial solution, whether it's an open source solution, whether it's SaaS, we're going to kind of talk about how that market's being broken down. Then I'm going to kind of talk about some rules that I've kind of seen coming out. And I think these are things you guys all know. And really, some of this material I'm trying for the first time, I'm looking for your reactions when I put some of these things up uh, that are out there. And then the last thing, how many of you are actually thinking about starting a company someday? Okay, that's awesome. That's great. I wish everybody's hand was going up, but 
I'm going to talk about how to pitch a company. So one of the things I've been doing since leaving Tenable Network Security is I found it with my wife, Google Tech Adventures. I've seen, I, I keep a lot of notes and tracking. I've seen probably about 200 to 250 different pitches from people uh, over the past two years. I've been doing a lot, mostly last year. But I'm going to give you some feedback on that. Um, all right, so the cyber market. It's really broken down into three areas. People are looking at, hey, hey Bruce, how's it going? Um, people are really looking for, I'm, I'm, just, I'm honored all these great people came out. Um, but basically, the, uh, especially on a Saturday, but the market is really broken down in three different processes. It's people who look for bad things, people who look for good things, and then people who realize that neither of those two things work and they want to throw things away and start over, right? Now, what does it mean to look for bad things? It means we're going to look for evil on our network, right? And we have so many different versions of what evil is. When you buy an antivirus product, you're trusting that vendor to look for evil on your, on your laptop. Um, but that market has been around for a long time. And there's no way to like define what evil and badness and things that shouldn't be on my network really, really are. Um, so we've seen a lot of different technology coming out. If you go back 20 years, you basically had firewalls and antivirus type products. And those didn't work, so we bought network intrusion detection systems. And those didn't work, so we turned on prevention right into that thing. And I, I'm trying not to despair. I mean, I, I come from that area, right? You guys know what I mean when it doesn't work, right? It's not a perfect solution. There's no black box solution out there where you can turn things on and go, go home at night, right? We're not, we're not doing that thing. So, you know, so after the network IDS and IPS things, now things started to get real interesting. We had to have context. So the SIM market was born. Let's start gathering all these logs and put them into kind of one spot. And that caused a lot of help for some people. It created a lot of jobs and certifications, but it caused a lot of pain and suffering. And if you look at some of the biggest breaches that happened, you know, OPM, JP Morgan, you know, different things like that, these guys had lots of sense. They had lots of people looking at different things that were out there. Um, so what happened after that? Well, we got into a lot of different things. This is really like the last couple of years. People have basically said, we assume we are going to be hacked. We assume we are going to be compromised. So now we need forensics, right? Forensics from the endpoint. We have this EDR market. We need forensics from the network. So we have a rebirth of products like, like NetWitness. Maybe they can go into the cloud. All, all that kind of stuff. And there's more and more telemetry that's out there. I'm going to talk a bit more about that, that later. And then some of the things that we thought the SIM was supposed to do started showing up in other products, right? Hey, let's just look at authentication logs and see if Ron Gula's credentials showed up somewhere else. That's the UBA mark, user behavioral uh, anomaly detection and, and, and whatnot. So, so there's a lot of that stuff going on. The last thing that happened is probably in the last year or so is sort of this birth of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, there's a lot of people who've said, look, I can show up on your network, gather all your telemetry, and I, I can do statistics, I can call it machine learning, but basically at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you if something changed or summarize everything in such a way that it, you as an analyst can go look at things that change. Just because you had a spike in DNS queries or uh, firewall logs or something like that doesn't mean you have APT on your network, but maybe that's something you should go and investigate. There's another type of machine learning, though, which is, hey, let's look at activity from all over the world and then create intelligence to share with an individual customer. And that's that's really interesting. That's like silence. That's basically people who are looking, like open DNS, they look at the queries from all over the internet. And we benefit from that kind of analysis. Now, we can debate if it's machine learning, if it's AI, but you're really leveraging the internet as a whole and, and, and bringing that back. And then the last thing, I personally, you know, Marty Rush and I, we kind of did a lot of this honeypot stuff at, at, at BBN, and I really like to see the state of the art going on. As a pen tester, you know, if there's real active honeypots on the network, whether it's honey tokens, whether it's something that looks like the corporate exchange server, that's going to give you pause and, you know, make you very difficult to go over. So there's a bunch of new vendors out in that space who are really doing and making, making it easier. My biggest criticism of honeypots has always been they're hard to set up. They're, they're, you, can, you can have a lot of legal issues. You can have a lot of problems operationally. But the new vendors that are out there, TrapX is one of them. I have no relation with it other than I, I kind of like the technology. I, it's kind of interesting to, to, uh, to, to look at. All right, so that's finding bad stuff. And if we get to Q&A later and somebody says, hey, what do you think of product XYZ? Happy to answer that, not in front of everybody. So, um, all right, so let's talk about finding good things. You guys have all seen this equation, right? Risk equals threat times vulnerability. Somebody actually done it? Like, what do you do? Do you take Nessus, like CVE, CVSS scores, and multiply it times, like, snort severity scores? You know, there's products out there that do that. 
right? I, and, and it's interesting. Is it um, the threat from, you know, you know it's, it's, this, this doesn't really work at scale. This is a great concept to teach people. You know, I've actually seen some people go and they say, well, it's threat times vulnerability times asset, or threat times, or asset criticality, right? Threat times vulnerability times the amount of money I'm going to lose, right? Our concept of risk is really, we don't have it. We've been in this industry for 30 years now. We don't have a way that I can say your version of risk and your version of risk is the same. Well, then, you know, we, then we wonder why my password is going from 12 characters to 13 characters when somebody changes a policy. We, there's, there's no connection between those two things. So the current state of finding cyber good is kind of all over the place. Uh, the story I like to tell is I met a senior government official once. They're not in the room. Um, and I said, you know, hey, what do you want to do? And they're like, oh, I want to, I want to disrupt hackers. I want to make it harder for hackers and, and, and nation states to operate on my, on my network. And, and I said, oh, you mean like outbound firewall hackers? Yeah, you know, like, like forcing users to go through a proxy. Yeah, like, like patching systems. Yeah, like strong authentication, essentially two factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean compliance? No, no, we don't want any of that on the, on the network, right? But, I gotta tell you, I've given sort of these, these themes, I go out and I do a lot of different talking to either pen tester crowds and incident responding crowds, and almost everybody in these crowds is involved with some sort of, um, you know, the SANS, which is now Center for Internet Security, you know, critical controls, NIST cybersecurity framework, ISO, different things like that. And when you throw out that word framework, a lot of times people go, no, 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 I wanna be an incident responder, I wanna be a malware reverse engineer and stuff like that. Well. When you, you know, we're all rational adults. And when you say, I want to run a network a certain way, and here's the rules I want this network to live by, that's, that's kind of a framework. And a lot of times what's happened to date, you know, it's 2017, we didn't build the networks that we're on with these frameworks, so what do we have? We have a gap. We have a gap between what's on the network now and the frameworks that are actually going to be recommended or possibly required in the future. Now, what's going on with frameworks, right? We've got the SANS, like the CIS, like I said, I've said, I haven't said PCI yet. I actually believe PCI is a framework and because it's very comprehensive about how you're going to control your data and different things like that. And, you know, the government's come out with the NIST cybersecurity framework. And if you're a DOD, you have the risk measurement management framework and all, all things like that. If you read these things and this is your first exposure to cybersecurity, you will be, um, depressed, right? These are, they're, they're very, very long. They're very, but it's a complex thing. Information security, we still have the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But then you're like, oh, I want my users to VPN in over my exchange and we're going to move it to the cloud, right? So it, it's, it gets complex really, really, really fast. Um, what I believe is going to happen, though, is that you're going to see new approaches to measuring risk. So there's companies out there that basically claim that they can measure risk. Maybe they look for evidence of your data online. Maybe they look for evidence of compromises from your organization online. And they're going to call that risk management. Hey, that's great. Tell me all about that. You're not looking inside the firewall. Um, but that still is not, an, not a bad way of, of, of going. There's other people who look inside the firewall and they want to talk to the CFO and they want to talk to the board, which means they want to talk dollars and cents. And they have this process called value at risk or the fair model where they basically say, give me a list of all your assets. Give me a list of your liability, right? Like if you have PII on this asset and you lose credit card data or personal data, you're subject to a $50,000 fine. That's, that goes in the, 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 the loss column. And then they put all the controls associated with those things and they run an algorithm and it says, look, if you implement this control or that control, you will reduce your risk by this dollars and cents. And that's some of the things that have been missing, missing in our cybersecurity sort of vocabulary as an, as an industry. So I think this is going to happen. I also think this is going to happen because the insurance people, people realize that they don't have all the answers and they want to have some sort of cyber insurance, and the cyber insurance people are basically saying, we can cover crypto locker, but we have no idea how to cover like real risk or anything like that. So when these frameworks are used more um, often and more pronounced throughout the industry, you're going to see more exposure to those kind of things. And there's a lot of conversations going on. Uh, companies are plugged in the space cyber GRX, right? They're, what they're doing, if anybody here, has anybody had to get a SOC 2 audit from a vendor that they work with? Okay, so, so if you don't know what that is, you should learn what that is because you can add that to your resume and be more valuable to your companies, right? So third party risk. So you might be doing pen testing, you might be monitoring firewalls and risk for your organization, but if you're using Salesforce, if you're using Amazon, if you're using any external data centers, for example, you've got to have probably some sort of record of how well they are, they are doing. 
Well, at Tenable, we had almost 100 external customers. We had full-time employees just managing these things so we could go back to the DoD and say, yes, we're compliant in, in, in these areas. So companies like CyberGRX are gathering and crowdsourcing this kind of stuff and doing, uh, making this a lot easier. That's data that the cyber industry could use to actually come up with actuaries and find one way or another to, to, to do things. Now, if this compliance and frameworks is a little bit tough, I want to point you in, in, uh, in, in a presentation here. So this was two years ago. Uh, Sunil Yu, who works at Bank of America, he presented it at RSA, and he said, look, you can summarize the NIST cybersecurity framework this, this way. It's basically prescriptive. It's got five areas, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. But then he thinks about it in terms of my devices, my apps, my networks, my data, and my users. Now you, and, and, and this is very interesting to, uh, to do that because, you know, we are complex things. We think about IP addresses, network diagrams, uh, you know, telemetry, vulnerability results, and things like that. But when you do this and you put it onto a slide like this, this is not a plug for vendors, but think about what you have in your network and what your answer is for doing these controls. Now, I'm not, I, I think like, you know, Sourcefire is on here, IBM's on, it doesn't matter what vendors are on here. This is so you know what you're doing and you can communicate this to the rest of your organization. And it also says that if you've got blanks, well, you know that you've got shortcomings. So in this case, the recovery column is very, very much open. If you get owned, if you have data loss, you gotta recover, that's not something you're probably gonna get good at until it happens. But when you put it on a chart like this and say, look, this is what the NIST cybersecurity framework does, maybe we're overrated and, you know, identifying devices or doing that, you know, one way or, or another. Um, so I, I like that. And, and the uh, understanding the security vendor landscape using cyber defense matrix. Anybody can ping me after that and I'll, I'll send the URL out. But this is a great, easy way to understand frameworks and where you might have gaps in your, in your organization. All right. So the, the last sort of trend that's kind of going on, and, and the joke that I basically say is that, look, if you can detect all day with whatever you want to detect with, we know that eventually the bad guys and gals are going to get around us. You can audit all day and try to be compliant and fill in all those things. But even if you, even if you filled this 100% and you had the best um, incident response people in the world, the best threat intelligence, people are still going to get in. So there's sort of a move to basically say, how can I reduce the risk on my network? And there's a lot of things going on here all, all at the same time. A real simple one is cloud migration. How many people here have had to administer an exchange server? So a good bit of you, and you're still in security. That's why you got into security, right? So that's, that's, that's interesting. So, so an exchange server, what is an exchange? It's the Microsoft on-premise way to share email and send email and things like that. Um, you can't just have one because you gotta have reliability. So maybe you have two. Maybe you have a uh, failover, right? You can't just have email security for Microsoft. Maybe a Barracuda in front of it, right? Well, maybe you have a lot of users and you have to do two-factor authentication to get into that. Maybe you have to do that. You don't trust how they do it. You don't like their, their, their OWAP or, or their um, uh, you know, Outlook web interface online, Outlook web access. I forget the acronym there. But the point is, is that's a complex thing. Maybe you got to have a SAN backing it up. You have so much complexity just to move email around. And then here comes a salesperson from Microsoft that says, I can basically replace all that with basically some APIs to the internet called Office 365. Now, the bargain is Microsoft has all your data, but they can probably do a better job running an email server than perhaps your IT people can. And that's a tough pill to swallow. When I worked at US Internet Networking, that was basically our pitch. We could run the data better than you can because that's all we did. And by the way, we run 100 copies of Oracle 8, or whatever it was at the time, you're only running one. So we're gonna see bugs before you do, we're gonna see attacks against this infrastructure before you do. When you do a monolithic application like email, it becomes really, really easy to spot attacks, misconfigurations, performance issues, different things like that. But a lot of people are basically saying, I don't need to run IT anymore. IT is a very complex and random thing. I can outsource it, I can give it to other people, and when you do that, you get some benefits. Now, but the problem is, is you gotta give them your data. And as much as you can go through a data provider and see how certified they are, and they can tell you it's encrypted from the ground up and stuff like that, the vast majority of people I'm talking to in industry still view this as an experiment, unless you're on the West Coast. Then you just start out and you're using Gmail and doing things like that. So this is kind of what's going on right now. Now, another thing that's going on is our devices. Our devices are getting phenomenally better. Um, we still have zero days. We still have uh, things like that, but they're getting, the cost of those zero days is really, really up there. 
Uh, if you guys know about CanSec West, the, the, they run the pwn to own thing where they have teams that go out and they hack every major browser. Every major browser, every team submitted basically is zero day. Um, and you might say, hey, Ron, that's, that's, that's not good, right? Well, these are harder and harder. Everybody on the team is like, look, we had to work the hardest we could. Um, the other thing is you guys are all here. I'm sure you all work for the CIA in your day job and stuff like that. Finding teams to do reverse engineering and vulnerability discovery is getting harder and harder to do. The industry is getting better. Microsoft's getting better. Google's getting better. They're getting better at fixing things. So the endpoints are getting a lot harder. This is basically allows us to go to the cloud, right? If I trust this device and I trust that the data is at the cloud, I have a much simpler way of measuring all my stuff and my assets and whatnot. And then the last thing is that every company, no matter who they are, whether they are um, government, whether they are an automotive manufacturer, they are a software engineering shop. And, you know, we've done what we can do with source code auditing, right? You know, Veracode, Sigidel, all those kind of things. It doesn't give you guaranteed security. So what people are trying to do is reduce the complexity. And how are they reducing the complexity? If you have a complex application that's web-enabled, they are removing the complexity. And what do I mean when I say complexity? I mean the operating system. I mean the web server. I mean maybe the disk and the firmware that it's booting on. You can take most web applications and rewrite them in a much simpler, with much less lines of code, with new architectures. Containers, for example, that take advantage of elasticity. Uh, the Amazon API, where you have S3 buckets. You have APIs that don't even have compute next to them. You have things like, like Lambda, which just lets you kind of go and, and, and query things and, and do things without that. I mean, look at Uber, right? Uber's a bazillion dollar company now. They don't own the maps. They don't own the driver. They don't own the, the, the web page that these things are hosted on, right? It's just a little bit of code to, to make something of value. So when organizations, whether you're in, you know, healthcare.gov or you're trying to, you know, buy tickets for, for, for southwest.com, those applications that are being hacked and have a very, very complex way of doing web application auditing, they're all going to get redone with very scalable and very secure architectures. Now think about this. You remove the OS, you remove the web server, and you just have sort of logic running out there. Your attack space is a lot smaller. You still have things like Node.js that you have to patch, but you're not worrying about like patching a new Apache vulnerability or configuring Apache or patching Linux. You know, these are the things that kind of hold back a lot of the majority of stuff that's out there. And as, as CEO of Tenable, I saw this, right? I'd be like, hey, why haven't you patched these vulnerabilities? Well, you know, we have to wait for an outage. We have these other controls. In it's like, look, a lot of times that's just an excuse. So taking these, like, these applications and moving them to a more sustainable and easy to maintain type of thing is really what I believe is the way of, of the future. So, you know, what's going to hold us back is legacy stuff. You know, if you look at, like, I'm not a salesperson for Microsoft, but if you look at what's in Windows 10 versus what's not in Windows 7, right, there's a lot of value there. Well, you can't just go and upgrade to Windows 10 if you're a government agency or you're a, a, a bank or things like that. There's, there's, there's a lot of reasons. You're going to break things. There's a lot of ways to, 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 to fix that. But that question is the question, I think, for cybersecurity. I think 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now, our industry is going to be more about data governance and who can have access to my data and what third parties I'm working with and less about hunting a zero day. Uh, because I think those things are going to go, they're going to be harder and harder to do. Unless we still have Windows NT at ATMs, you know, 10 years from now. So nobody knows, nobody knows how that's going to go. All right. So I'm going to give you some, uh, couple, was there a question? No. I'm sorry. All right. Hearing things. I'm old. Um, all right. So new rules for cyber. I hope this resonates with, with you guys a little bit. So the first one is SIM is dead, but socks are not. So I get a pitch probably about once every two weeks where I'm going to do some sort of threat orchestration, uh, uh, incident response automation, some sort of, I'm going to do something because the SIMs can't, can't do it, right? And, and it's, 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 it's really interesting. I have yet to go to a SOC and not see Q1 and not see ArcSight or not see something that's homegrown, but something, you know, something, something like that. Um, it's going to happen. I think this is the year where it might. Now, right next to those things is Splunk, is Darktrace, is, is, is all these, you know, different kind of, of, of solutions that are out there to kind of augment those things, federal orchestration and things like that. So the socks are alive and well. What are they missing? They're missing more people. They're missing more automation. They're still missing more procedures because if you go out and you hunt for Stuxnet, but now you have this sort of whimmy thing that's moving around. There's no malware. There's no fingerprints. There's no nothing to go look for. You don't, and you weren't looking for that kind of activity. That's, that's, that's tough. So I'm starting to see 
you know, people thinking about deploying stuff like Endgame, right? Think people who are basically knowing that they're hunting and they want a platform to go hunt and, 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 and things like that. Um, another corollary to that is that we never had situational awareness. When I go in and I talk to people and I say, show me your SIM, show me the data you're collecting, and I, and I say, okay, I'm on your Wi-Fi, I'm in your sock. I'm going to go to, to, to www.google.tech, show me in, in, in your logs. Oh, well we, 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 no, we don't monitor the Wi-Fi, right? right? Um, or, or it's something like that. And, and sometimes it's like a legit, like all the Wi-Fi goes over here. To, like, like literally, I was at a corporate one, and they, they had like Comcast. Like you can get Comcast Wi-Fi. I'm like, that's not a bad solution, right? I'm not even on the network, right? But sometimes when I'm on the network and they can't log that kind of stuff, or um, have you ever been to some place or a conference center and you get to type in a code and say, hey, Ron, if you're running it on Wi-Fi, here's your ID and your code. Like, show me that in your SIM, right? So a lot of times I'm not seeing this full situational awareness. And the big thing that I'm really missing when I see these, these when I say situational awareness, is that other side of audit. Typically the SOC people only deal with bad things. But if you said, where's my list of assets? Where's my vulnerability lifecycle on this? Can I get a PCI report? Can I get anything like that? That's, that gap is there. And to me, that's real situation, real situational awareness. And what I'm hoping is that this, this, this orchestration industry that's out there starts to embrace non-compliance issues and, and patching issues in real time. Like, if you're going to create an alert and a workflow that says, Snort just found this awesome buffer that's going to go into my DNS server, I really hope that they can create a workflow that the firewall in front of the DNS server is down and port 22 SSH is opening and there's connections that weren't there before. We're not seeing those kind of things in, 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 in socks today. Um, I kind of already mentioned this. You know, if you go to Salesforce, if you go to Office 365, and, and I don't want to offend anybody, but they're probably going to do a better job than you running your own CRM and you running your own email. Now, don't, I'm, I'm not criticizing what Fed, FedGov is basically exactly like Office 365. They're, they're, uh, I don't know, don't, don't tweet that out. Um, but, um, but they're, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to be very open to those architectures and, 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 and do cloud first and do, do things like that. And I probably talk a whole, whole hour on that. Um, but this is really for your mom and dad. This is really for um, the dentist office. This is really for you know the, the smaller SMB. I really believe if you're a small company, and a small company could be thousand people, right? Tenable, right? I, I used to feel like I got the best IT security people running my Exchange server, and then we switched to Google Gmail, and it was like, oh yeah, yeah, they see traffic from the internet. We see traffic to Tenable, and that's you, you can't compete with that, right? So if you're going to participate with something like that, you got you got to do something like that. So by default, cloud apps are better. Um, for security apps, though, in the cloud, you got to take it with a grain of salt, right? So let's talk about Cloudflare, right? So Cloudflare, phenomenal company. You might, you know, how, any any business, and Tenable's the same way. Anybody who's doing business, you're gonna someone's gonna point the finger and say good, bad, you know, you know, whatever. But but from an architectural point of view, hey, let's take a CDN, let's put some web application frameworks in front of it, and let's protect websites, you know, from DDoS. Great, that's awesome. Um, the problem that they just had, though, is it, it's, I, I believe I would call it, and it just, this just came out, but you can expose credentials that might have gone through that kind of stuff at the end. It's called cloud bleed. I believe. This just came out. I'm not, I'm not up to speed 100% on it. Um, but that's, that's, that's just the, the, um, uh, the, the story of the week. Um, what I've seen is this. If you have ArcSight, if you have Q1, if you have um, SourceFire, pick any modern enterprise vendor. And then you have, and again, I'm not trying to criticize vendors, but you have somebody who says, I can take maybe 5% of that feature set or 10% of that feature set, run it at Amazon, put a slick web interface on it, and make it easy to buy, easy to deploy. There's a lot of those kind of companies. I'm not saying they're, they're bad, because one thing I'll tell you is from enterprise companies, people don't deploy 100% of our products. So having a cloud security application that does exactly what you need it to do, that might be the great thing. But don't confuse a company that's six months old with a company that's 16 years old, you know, doing these enterprise things. And, 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 and the, the thing is, if you go to RSA, you're seeing the barrier to entry to kind of get into RSA is lower because of the cloud. Right? We don't have to worry about storage. We don't have to worry about deploying anything on-prem. And these are things that when you have engineers working on them, your products get better. So all I'm saying is take security apps that are cloud only with a grain of thought. Now, I've invested in a bunch of these companies. I'm just saying as a buyer, you've got to watch out for stuff like that. All right, the last big rule. 
Uh, managing confidentiality, integrity, and availability, it, it, it never went away. And what I mean by this is that when you're outsourcing to Salesforce, when you're outsourcing to Office 365, when you're outsourcing to your security vendor, you still have to worry about these kind of things. Now, it might manifest itself in PCI, in a framework, or in something like that, but when you basically give your data to somebody else, you're still responsible for this. You're still responsible for keeping those things alive and well that are, that are going there. All right, so I'm kind of curious what people think about these uh, these rules. All right, now the last, last thing we're going to talk about before we get to Q&A. How do you pitch what you do? How do you pitch what you do? And and I hope that you might take that, you might be just working on a project in your office. You're trying to get funding to, to, to deploy a, a, I don't know, a proof of concept of Greylog or something like that. Hopefully you can you can do this. So this is real basic stuff. Um, but you'd be surprised how often, what problem are you, are you trying to solve I don't get to until I'm 10 slides into a paper, or, or 10 pages into a, a, a PowerPoint. Now think about that. Hi, Ron, I've, I've, I've solved cybersecurity. Can you look at my, my presentation? Sure. What do I see in this presentation? I don't, I'm, I'm not seeing what they solved right up front. So what problem are you trying to solve? What problem are you solving? This is something you should ask any vendor, any outsourced team, any consultant, anything. You're, what are you going to do for me? What are you doing? And that answer, it should be nuanced. You should be able to answer that question that demonstrates that not only do you have command of this problem, but you're nuanced and aware of the market. Um, I, I'll give you a good example. So there's a, there's a, there's a company I've invested, it's, it's, it's Stealth, and it's a web application firewall company. And, and basically their pitch was, look, we're doing whitelisting, web application firewalling, and we're not using machine learning. And, and that comment right there, it blew me away because I've seen 20 other web application firewall pitches that were all machine learning based. Let's learn what's normal, let's look for what's different. I'm not saying that's bad, but this was very unique. And they that, that in, the, in that opening statement, they, they were able to, to, to do that. Actually, I got ahead of myself. So the problem they're solving is web security. How do you solve it, right? So that's the second thing. How do you solve it? You gotta be very nuanced in that answer and very understanding of what the limitations of those problems that, that are out there. Uh, sometimes it's basic business, right? Maybe we have a cheaper solution. It's the same solution you already know, but ours is, ours is cheaper. Maybe it's maybe it's easier to use. Maybe it's it's uh, it gives you better performance, right? So you can do those kind of things. Um, but how do you solve it? So many times, and I, I'm guilty of this too. I jumped right to the how. What and how are such different things. The what you're trying to do and the how you're doing it. A lot of times, people get so excited about the technology, they pitch you on that how versus not even what you're you're doing. I'm getting a little physical or um, uh, uh, philosophical with, with with people here, but. You know, second slide, how do you solve it? Third thing, show some proof. And this is the thing that I think is, is really, really hard for people to do. Customer references. Do you have patents? Do you have a demonstrated lab, you know, analyzing that your, your widget can go 100 gigabits, right? If you say you can go 100 gigabits or you say you can go 10 gigabits, show me the proof that it's, you know, nobody goes 10 gigabits. Show me it's 6.9. Show me it's, 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 it's 7.3, something along those lines, right? Show some proof. Show some screenshots. Show those kind of things. And then the, the fourth thing is if you're talking to somebody and you're asking for them for investing, what do you want with the money, right? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to hire people? Are you going to develop more? Are you going to buy a third party app? Party you you want to have some sort of sense that if you write somebody some, some money or you help them fundraise, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to go into marketing? Are they going to go into development? Are they going to go into those different kind of things? And then lastly, this is the thing I really like to see, is what's your vision? What do you want to be when you, when you grow up? And, and what I mean by that is, is maybe you want to be a Cisco. Maybe you want to be a $8 billion company. Right? Maybe you're okay and you realize that the, the, the product that you're doing is a great feature that might be in the portfolio of a Hewitt Packard or a potential acquirer. I like to see what is that sort of event horizon of the company, what do they want to do? You know, maybe some of these, these companies that, that, that they're involved, they're, they're doing movements. They've got huge user bases, half a million users, a million users. What do they want for, for, for that type of thing? What's the vision of how, of how they go? Now, those are the five things I like to see. Now, what are those, what are the things that are not in there? And, and I, I, if you've ever pitched me, I'm not, I'm not picking on you, right? This stuff's all important, right? Your team bios, who your advisors are, you know, uh, your customer success stories, your, how many's funding today? You, you know what this is? This is background material. This gives a potential investor the ability to engage with you. You know, because by the time I get to your how and what you're doing, I've forgotten who your advisors are. But if I'm interested and I'm engaged, 
I'm probably going to say, okay, well, how'd you get here? You know, wh why'd you do this? Oh, your, your, your advice. This is all great background. I'm not saying you, you got to have a five page. This is your first five points should be what I said. All this stuff should be backup slides. It really should. Um, that last one, by the way, market size and growth. I mean, this, this pitch, I'm going to tell you, never works. The market is a $2 billion market. If we only convert 1% of it, that's, you know, and that, that, we're all guilty of that. We're trying to get that, 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 get that kind of stuff going. Um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of how to, to go about doing that. And I've seen it's really hard to do this. I've had this done to me at Tenable. When we went out and did that fundraise in the ginormous round, I had people pull me aside who knew better. Like, your, your pitch isn't that good. And, and I'm serious. I'm serious. And, and frankly, you know, when you think about it, if you can get it down, it's everybody's more efficient, right? And I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I don't espouse like time management and stuff like that. But, you know, I do believe in half hour meetings. I do believe in, meetings where you don't have to actually have an hour if it's scheduled and things like that. And it should be the same thing when you're investing and, and pitching somebody, right? The, you should be able to communicate your idea in such a way that it's very nuanced and easy to get, uh, to get in there. All right, so, so having said that, I think we got some time for questions, but we talked about, you know, the three types of cyber, the finding the badness, finding the goodness, building the future that, that's resilient. We talked about a little bit of new rules, and I gave you that five slide uh, type, type of pitch. And, um, you know, I wanted to go maybe a little bit to 10 o'clock, but I, I think is there an opportunity to ask questions? People got questions? Yes. All right, so we're going to go to Q&A. All right, great. So for the folks in the other room, I believe your question was, you know, if you have connectivity to the internet go away, how does that affect what I'm recommending, which is basically to embrace Office 365, Salesforce, different, different things like that. So that's, that's a great question. And that's part of that whole risk management framework. So, so can you do your work offline? Um, you know, but when you start looking at the reliability of an, of a, of an organization, you've got power. So Tenable, right? We have an office up in Columbia. We had generators. We knew the generators could only last, you know, so long. Um, the thing that hit us the most, though, was internet outages. We would have, you know, connections to the internet that, that went out and, and, and different things like that. I think the bigger you get, the more likely you have multiple connections to the internet, the multiple power sources and things like that. But when you're small, it, that is that is a risk. Um, I don't know that we're going to see an outage on Salesforce. I don't know that we're going to see an outage on Amazon. I don't know that we're going to see an outage. Now, we might. But I, I have a hard time seeing that, just knowing how those things are designed. Having said that, if you go to a competitor where they're only in maybe one data center or two data centers and they're one DDoS away from, from that, you've got, to, you've got to keep that in mind when you're putting your data in the cloud. Uh, like I said, most people are holding things onto data and they're looking at that, that stuff out there. But like Salesforce is the biggest one I worry about, uh, just because of how, how much data goes in there for the U.S. I don't know if I answered your question. But. Mm -hmm. I, I think the best, without naming the nation, I was in Asia, and they actually didn't want to do, the government didn't want to do business with Tenable, and they cited a risk that Tenable was on Salesforce. And they said, you know, if you have too much stuff on the internet, too much stuff, you could be out of business, you can't support me. Well, that's interesting. A year later, they had actually opened up a cloud lab, and the government was on Gmail. You know, so it, it's, it's, it's interesting, it really is. Um, uh, last thing on that is before somebody says, what if on is Salesforce, you should, they should know what their own outage rate is. And, and I've really seen this happen a lot where people are, are and I'm, I'm not saying it's you, um, but people are objecting to the cloud because it means their job, right? If my job is to run those exchange servers that I was talking about, I'm going to come up with a hundred reasons never to go to Office 365. So just make sure that before somebody has that conversation, we know with that. And this happened to me at U.S. Internet Networking. I had people saying, oh, you know, it's just too expensive, you can't do it. And I'd be like, hey, what's your uptime? Oh, we've never gone down. And so you talk to the work, oh, no, we're, we're, we're down like every weekend, you know, and, 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 and that. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind. So other questions, other comments? Yeah, Bruce.
So, so the question was, what are the other intangible benefits to potential getting, getting an investment? And, you know, when I did these five things, it was really from an angel po point of view. And, and sometimes when you're, when you're a startup and you're getting angel funds, um, you know, you, you might get some cachet having an advisor such as yourself or being associated with Mach 37 or some, something like that. But typically if you're raising half a million to a million dollars, it's, it's really money from, you know, doctors, lawyers, high net worth individuals, you know, things, things like that, former CEOs, that kind of stuff. Um, but when you move up to something that's headlineable, you know, Excel, Insight, Investing, and Tenable, um, there's a lot of intangible benefits, right? The state gets involved, the media gets involved, and that's all free press for, for, for you and your, your, your company. So that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, even if, even if you, somebody here is in the middle of a venture raise and they're getting a, you know, it's not record setting, but it's, it's, it's a million dollars, it's two million dollars, it's, you, there's a lot that you can do with that. Uh, you can recruit better because, you know, if you think about it, hey, come with me, I'm going to start a company in my garage. That's tough if you're working at, you know, a government job or a, a big corporation or something like that. But if you say, oh, I just closed a $2 million deal, you might be able to recruit uh, better. Um, so there's a lot of benefits that you can get from, uh, from, from doing that kind of stuff. Very cool. Other questions? He, he, can we do two questions from the same person? No. <laughs> so the question is, how do you manage the third-party risk that's inherent when you go to the cloud? Um, so you could do it a couple of different ways. What I what I would do is I would want to understand what are your requirements for your organization. So if you're a DoD contractor, there's very very clear requirements of what you need to do with third-party providers, and you probably have third-party providers right now who maybe not even be on the cloud, but they're still a third party. They may be vending machines, things like that. So all of those have to be kind of complied with. Uh, but at the same time, for more of the IT type stuff, where data is in motion and you have you know data that, that's under control of somebody else, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, what I would tell you is that if you want to do something along those lines, get a pitch from Microsoft on this for their Azure program and compare it to a Google pitch and a Rackspace pitch and an and a, uh, Amazon pitch. Microsoft, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not a salesperson for Microsoft, but they've taken the attitude that they're late to market and that they are going to certify for everything. If you get a pitch from Azure and they're going to be compliant with this, compliant with that, can you pen test them? Yes, all these different things. So you have some of those assurances right there. Amazon, not so much. They're much more, hey, we're the, the big one out here. We have all these features and that's been kind of their, their focus. Um, but that's one really interesting way to do that kind of stuff. But that you have to comply with anything you're required to do, first of all. Um, so you might be in a business where you can't outsource in some cases. So long, long answer to a short question. Ma'am. So the question was, if you're a, some, you want to go work for a startup and you're evaluating startups and, and you want to, you want to know what's, what's, how to, how to interview and maybe select them and things like that. So, so it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of different startups that are, that are out there. I'm working with one right now where the, the CEO is here in America and all of the developers are overseas, right? So if you're going to join that environment, that's an interest. You might be the only U.S. developer in that in that case, right? That's a very very interesting environment to kind of, to kind of work with. Um, I'm also working with other startups where the team, you know, worked at like TAO at the NSA, and they've gone out and they've started that. Well, now you're working with these founders who've been working with each other for five or six years. This is the first company, but you're not one of that founding team, you know. So the, so timing and and culture and all those kind of things are really really hard to figure out. But, you know, the biggest thing you can do if you're going to go to work for a startup is basically just ask them, you know, what do you, what do you want from me? What are you willing to give me? There's, there's all sorts of ways you can, you know, maybe you're in a situation where you don't have to have income for a while. Maybe you don't have a family yet and you can take stock and really, and maybe be like, hey, maybe you can be our third founder. Um, so, so there's a lot of ways to approach that, that kind of stuff. I would, I would really suggest, uh, you know, you speak to other people. I, I would talk to Rick. I'd talk to anybody who's done uh, any type of large amount, because there's probably good situations and bad situations, depending on who that is. But don't expect, uh, if you work at the government, or you work for, again, like a Lockheed Martin, AOL, something like that, you should not expect that going to a, a startup company from a salary point of view. Um, 
because you're but you are taking a risk, so you should be able to get some equity, some stock, and and try to get into that into that vision. So good good question, good question. And and that's the other thing. If you if you have a friend who's thinking about doing it, tell them to do it. The industry needs more startups, more opportunity. I I really feel like. Again, this is nothing bad at, at, at working at the government, working at, working at the Booz Allen, anything like that. They're doing great work. I want just about 2% of those people to leave and start companies. If we did that, we would actually have more people in cyber than like Silicon Valley has. And so if you know of anybody who's thinking about it, yeah, come on, try it, try it. Go do it, take a chance, right? Um, don't be afraid of failure. It's, it's, it's really something that's good for the, it's, it, it'll change your life. That's the way I, that's probably the last thing I should say, right? It'll change your life. It's good. Um, I think we're good. It's 10 o'clock. All right. I, I, one, one last question. See, that nobody wants to be the one last question, right? All right. Hey, guys, thanks for coming. Congratulations. This is getting to be a uh, start off really well. I uh, look forward to seeing everybody else today. Enjoy the rest of B-Sides. Thanks.